What an opportunity for you to understand Bible prophecy. What an opportunity for you to register and invite others to be part of a special YouTube evangelistic series by Cami Utman, sponsored by Adventist World Radio. The theme is Unlocking Bible Prophecy. You see, Bible prophecy is so important. It is so relevant to today, even more so because of the pandemic. Now, is this the end of the world? Is this uh, the end of time? Well, I want to tell you, we are very close to the coming of Jesus. There are great benefits from watching Unlocking Bible Prophecy. Register for the event today. Invite your friends to register and to view Unlocking Bible Prophecy. God bless you in a wonderful way as we learn from the Bible every day and understand that Bible prophecy will reveal Christ and His soon coming. God bless you. Have you ever wondered what happens the moment after you die? Have you ever been fearful of death? And what does the Bible teach about the afterlife? You might be surprised. It may not be what you think. My name is Cami Ootman. Stay with me for the answers to these questions as Unlocking Bible Prophecies starts now. The rise of an international pandemic, about the coronavirus. polarizing global politics, the mismanagement and corruption, increasingly destructive natural disasters. Bushfires in Australia are a warning of what may be to come around the world. What does it all mean? What does the future hold? Join international speaker Kami Utman on a journey for answers in unlocking Bible prophecies. In her travels around the world, she's come face to face with real life struggles, but in the midst of them, she's found miracles of hope. Join Kami Utman for unlocking Bible prophecies as she shares how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled faster than ever before. Can you believe it? Tonight marks the halfway point of Unlocking Bible Prophecies. This continuing series of presentations will help you better understand the Bible, prophecies, and where this world is headed. You can go to awr.org forward slash Bible to watch all previous programs and find some powerful resources for further study. I hope that you were, re you were inspired by yesterday's presentation, The Counterfeit. We saw that there is no biblical evidence that God's day of worship has changed from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day Sunday. History confirms that Sunday worship is a man-made tradition. Constantine united pagan sun worship and Christianity under the helm of Sunday worship. Let's remember that for every Bible truth, Satan has his counterfeit. God's law is like his character. It never changes. Tonight, we will discover prophecy reveals that what people believe about death will be a major influence in last day events. Can we find hope that goes beyond the grave? What really happens at death? The question of what really happens at death has a solid biblical answer. Remember, you can click on the link below to sign up for our online Bible school, ask questions, and also send a prayer request. Also, feel free to leave your comments in the chat box. In fact, why don't you let us know right now what country you're watching from? I can't wait to see. Let's pray now before we study the grave. Dear Heavenly Father, King of the universe, King of our hearts, Lord, empty me of self, fill me with your Holy Spirit, and anoint my lips with only your words. We praise you for the truth that we find in your word because we can count on you. And we so love you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Have you ever been at the bedside of the dying or felt the sting of losing a child in the prime of life? If death's black veil has separated you from the love of your life, maybe you've wondered, is this all there is to life? We live, we die, and then what? Since the beginning of time, the cycles of life and death have left holes in people's hearts. Tonight, we will find the Bible pulls back the veil and solves death's mystery. 
the Bible will expose the popular lies regarding what happens when you die. Ephesians 5.11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Jesus makes sure to provide us with solid evidence in Scripture so that we do not have to guess, wonder, or worry. We can know and be grounded in the truth. Please try to set aside all preconceived ideas on the subject of death and allow God's Word to speak. Let the Bible inform you. Now, I recognize that even Christians and non-Christians look at this subject of death differently. Some religions believe in reincarnation. Some secular people believe that death is the end with nothing beyond the grave. If you would ask most Christians, what happens when you die? They would say, a person has a soul that goes to heaven or hell when they die. Others might believe in purgatory, a uh, in-between stop. Are the dead asleep waiting for the resurrection when Jesus comes? Or are they already in heaven? And if they are in heaven, do souls have eyes? Can they speak? Do they have mouths or ears? If a soul has eyes and a mouth and ears and you can see it up in heaven, why does it have to come back for the body? Hmm? So there are all kinds of confusing questions. People are really perplexed about the subject of death. Is the soul immortal or is there a resurrection? You see, if the soul is immortal, then it could go to either heaven or hell immediately after death. If the soul is immortal, then the dead could actually talk to the living. The whole issue of death has to do with the question of immortality. Do we have it now? Will it be given to us at the second coming of Christ? Hmm. Our theme will give us the answers. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, then it's not for me. There once was a little boy walking in a graveyard. One of the headstones caught his eye. The inscription read, Friend, stop as you go by, as you are now once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. So prepare yourself to follow me. Well, the little boy took out his crayon from his pocket and scribbled on the headstone, To follow you, I'm not content until I know just where you went. All ages from all times want to know where you go when you die. The Bible gives us dependable answers that reveal not only what happens after death, but also how to face death with new hope and confidence. The very first chapter of the book of Revelation introduces us to a glorious person, the person of Jesus. He is dressed in a glowing white robe. His eyes are like flames of fire. Jesus identifies himself in Revelation 1.18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus conquered death, so he holds the keys to the grave. Any believer who dies and rests in Jesus can look forward to the resurrection. But somebody says, uh, what does the Bible teach about the idea of the immortal soul? Well, let's go back to Genesis, to the creation week, to find a clue as to what happens when a person dies. Maybe if we understand what happened at our creation, we can understand something about what happens when we die. The Bible says in Genesis 2 verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Notice these three key phrases here. God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Does the Bible say that God put an immortal soul in Adam? No, it doesn't say that. Instead, it reveals the formula for the human being. Dust plus spirit equals a living soul. Or another way to describe it, element of earth plus breath equals a living being. A living soul means a living person. Adam became a living being or a living person. You see, I don't have a soul. I am a soul, a living creature, a person, and so are you. 
We want to find out what a soul is and if it is immortal and if it can ever die. Ezekiel 18.4 tells us, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul who sins shall die. Hmm. The Bible says a living soul dies. So a person dies. A life dies. These three words are interchangeable. Matthew 16, 25 to 26, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mortal means subject to death. You can die. Immortal means imperishable. You cannot die. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Only the King of the universe is immortal. We believers who live and die on earth will receive immortality only when Christ comes. 1 Timothy 6, 15, 16. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. Again, the repeated truth is that God alone has immortality. You see, pagan Greek philosophy taught that the soul is Im immortal. It is a man-made teaching that the soul could live separately from the body and it somehow has a life of its own. The Bible teaches that human beings are an integrated unit, physical, mental, and spiritual. These components are inseparable. It takes all three parts to make a whole person. Whereas spiritualism and the New Age philosophies teach that the soul is immortal, these man-made teachings separates the soul from a person at death as if they are two separate entities. Spiritualism teaches that when you die, there is this essence of you that floats up to heaven and lives on and that you can come back and communicate with the living. Friends, do you see and understand why this is such a deadly idea? The devil can use this fal these false ideas about death to deceive us, and he does. Read what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, meaning indestructible, and we shall be changed. When God created Adam, he placed his breath within him, not an immortal soul. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Think of it. Death is creation in reverse. So then what happens when a person dies? What is it that goes back to God? Is it a mystery? Let's have the Bible answer, as always. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Okay, so the body goes to the dust, but the spirit that goes back to God is not something that is conscious. It is the breath or power of God that returns to God. God has preserved the identity of that person in his mind. The Old Testament Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, which means breath. So spirit and breath are the same thing. The spirit and soul are different. God forms man out of the dust of the ground. That is his body. God breathes into man his ruach, the Hebrew word for spirit or breath. And then man becomes a living soul. When a person dies, the body returns to dust. The spirit or breath of life, the power of life, goes back to God. Job 27.3 shows us breath and spirit are the same. 
All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So the Spirit of God is obviously breath, and not some spirit ghost coming out of your nose. I will illustrate this concept with a light bulb. Say I want to light up this room. I will need this light bulb, but I need more than just a plain light bulb. Let's make this bulb represent a person's body. In order to have illumination or light, I need to get power to this light bulb. This bulb alone cannot give me light. I need a power source. So the power, the spark of life, represents God's breath. The power comes through the cord into the bulb and that produces light. Just like when God's breath entered Adam's body, it produced life. Then what happens when you unplug the light? The power is gone. So when we stop breathing and our heart stops beating, we die. And our breath or our spark of life returns to God. As Job told us, breath does not equal soul. Breath equals life. Is there any consciousness in death? Psalms 146 verse 4 says, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. Ezekiel 9, 5 and 6, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for their memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. What did it say? The dead know nothing? Why not? Because at death their thoughts perish and there is no longer any consciousness. They no longer have feelings of love, hatred, or envy. Our dead loved ones are resting peacefully in their graves. Now this next fact may surprise you. Did you know that the Bible teaches death is like a sleep, a peaceful sleep that lasts until Jesus' second coming? And did you know that the Bible refers to death as sleep more than 50 times? Psalms 13 verse 3 says, Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Again, we see that the Bible calls death a rest. Nowhere in scripture is there an immortal soul. No. One day as Jesus and his disciples were traveling to visit the home of his friends Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, he received urgent news that Lazarus had become very sick and died. Jesus waited three days before arriving at their home. What's interesting are the statements he makes on the way there. John 11, 11 through 14. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. His disciples were puzzled. Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. They assumed Jesus meant Lazarus was sick and was resting. However, Jesus was speaking of his death, not about getting rest while sleeping. The disciples thought he would wake up in the morning and feel better. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For Jesus, as for all Bible writers, death is sleep. Jesus then visited Lazarus' home and said to Martha, now notice the words here very carefully, John eleven twenty three, 23, your brother will rise again. Jesus didn't say to Martha, don't cry, this is amazing news, your brother's soul is now in heaven. No, Jesus said he would rise from his grave. We are told next what Martha believed about death in John eleven twenty four twenty five. 24, 25. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Martha, who received her religion directly from Jesus, believed her brother would be resurrected at Jesus' second coming. As Christ approached the tomb, he called Lazarus, come forth. And on Jesus' command, Lazarus woke and came out of his grave alive. Let's imagine this scenario with the popular belief that once you die, you go straight to heaven. 
At graveside, Jesus would have looked up to heaven calling, Lazarus, come on down. Now, I'll tell you something. If I were Lazarus and I had been up in heaven for three or four days and Jesus commanded me to come down, my immediate response would be, oh, please, Lord, no. I love it up here so much. I really don't want to come back to earth. Wouldn't you have said that too? If what people believe is true, Lazarus should have written a whole book in the Bible about the glories he saw in heaven. Or the paparazzi of that day would have asked him a million questions about what heaven is like. But there's no record of anything. Because there couldn't be. Lazarus was asleep the whole time in the grave. Exactly like Jesus said. The Bible describes how there are no tears in heaven and his joys are unimaginable. People say, I love to think of my mother up in heaven looking down at me. But what if you had a husband that abused you and your mother's up in heaven watching that abuse? What if a mother is up in heaven and her son is shooting up drugs in his veins and, and ruining his life? Do mothers in heaven bear all this pain for their children's problems here on earth? God is too merciful for that. We are told in Job 14, 21, his sons come and to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he does not perceive it. And in Psalms 115, 17, it says, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. The dead do not go straight to heaven, friends, because if they were in heaven, they'd be praising the Lord for bringing them there. The Bible mentions the word soul 1,600 times, but never uses the term immortal soul. And it always describes death as a sleep. Think of it this way. People who have surgery frequently describe going under when the anesthetic is administered, they experience a dizziness. Many hours can pass before the patient wakes up. Sometimes they wake up in a fog or feeling the pain and wonder what just happened. He next re recognizes he is in the recovery room. As his mind clears, he realizes that time elapsed between the dizziness and the pain. Even though the pain seemed to come right after the dizziness, dizziness. The person was asleep and unaware while time passed. This demonstrates what happens at death as people will not realize they have died. The next moment they are aware of will be Jesus coming in the clouds. Now, what about the thief on the cross? Didn't Jesus say he went to heaven? Luke 23, 42 and 43. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus did not promise the dying thief he would be with him in heaven that exact same day. No, Jesus himself did not go that day into paradise. Remember, in death, he slept in the tomb, and on resurrection morning, Jesus clearly says in John 20, 17, I am not yet ascended to my father. So how are we to understand what Jesus told the thief? What Christ did say that day to the thief on the day of crucifixion, on the day of apparent defeat and darkness, when all seemed lost was this, you will be with me in paradise. The promise was given. The thief died with the assurance of eternal life, like any other child of God, to be raised on that great resurrection morning at Christ's second coming. Keep in mind, in the original manuscripts of the scriptures, the Greek language was without punctuation and was put in centuries later. There are two places in the Bible that we will look at right now where commas have been misplaced. The first is the text we just read in Luke 23, verse 43. By moving the comma over only one word, the Bible completely harmonizes with itself. The text says, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. The second place we'll look at a missing comma is in Acts 19.12. The King James Version uh, talks about sick handkerchiefs. Hmm. 
so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, and the diseases departed from them. Okay, now let's put a comma in. So that from his body were brought unto the sick, handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them. The comma makes all the difference. So we can see super clearly that when you die, you sleep and await the resurrection. So if we know this is the truth, then immortality before the second coming is a lie. Only God has immortality. Why would Satan want us to believe that we do not die? It began with his first lie in the Garden of Eden, and the human race is still believing it. Thousands of years later, his evil angels can masquerade as our dead loved ones. They can bring us so-called messages from beyond the grave. They can mislead us into accepting Satan's lies. Do not fall for the old serpent Satan's first lie. Why does Satan want people to believe that the dead are alive and can be contacted? So his fallen angels can pose as spirits of the dead and deceive many people and lead them astray. There is a channel that is regarded as sacred by many, a channel through which Satan binds souls. Voices speak, apparitions appear, and a bewitching power enters a human being. This is spiritualism. It can begin so simply by toying with Ouija boards, learning how to cast spells, how to become a witch, but later there seems no escape. The position that is of no consequence, what men believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. He knows that the truth received in the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, and a whole other gospel. My colleague Sue and I were on an early flight from Palm Springs to Denver. It was a very small plane, and I sat down next to a very distinguished looking businessman. He introduced himself as Nick with a lovely English accent. He shared that he was flying to one at one of his homes in Colorado at a popular ski resort. After some pleasant pleasantries were exchanged, I simply commented, God has blessed you. Ooh, he retorted, no, the goddess has, and his whole body grimaced. Next, a two-hour friendly but frank conversation ensued. I knew right then and there I needed to pray to my Heavenly Father for the right words, and God always comes through. Nick had devoted his life to goddess worship at a very young age. He told me point blank, Christians are the enemy, which makes you my enemy. We are on opposing sides, for I am a soldier of the goddess. Well, I turned to him and I said, well, I am the soldier for the one almighty God. There was a bit of a stalemate there for a moment. I said, Nick, you are not my enemy. Satan is. The Bible tells us who wins this war. Now, my friend Sue was only two rows ahead and overheard bits and pieces of our conversation because it's early in the morning and the plane is quiet except for Nick and I. And she began to pray. Nick continued to share. I have been training my whole life to annihilate the Christians. It is positioned to happen soon. Years ago, the goddess gave me step-by-step -step instructions on building my software company for this, for this fight. She has made me very wealthy and successful. She will soon emerge and rise up from the earth. He continued, since I gave myself over to her in my childhood, I've had no choice but to follow her directions. Nick and I went on to discuss free will, what happens at death, the truth behind apparitions, and Satan's deceptions. Similar information you and I are discussing here tonight. I shared my view of a loving, mighty, personal God who protects and provides for me. Whereas he described his thoughts were that God's a tormentor and fiercely cruel. He shared many pieces of his life with me, including how his dead family members appear to speak with him, as well as three additional apparitions that he called demons who torment him often. 
I shared from the Bible how the dead know not anything, how evil angels impersonate and harass. I informed Nick, only God can rid you of these demons. I implore you to fall on your knees and ask God to prove himself to you, because he will. He is real and cares about you, Nick. Just give God a try. Nick divulged, I have been training my whole life to annihilate the Christians. It is positioned to happen soon. The goddess will soon emerge and rise up from the earth. I responded, yes, I believe that Bible prophecy tells us that some of those who stand for Bible truth will be persecuted before Jesus returns. But at the second coming, believers will return to Eden, eternal life in heaven. I turned towards him and asked him, so Nick, what is your end game? He became quiet, appeared stunned, and finally said, I've honestly never thought about that, nor has a goddess revealed an end game to me. I will have to ask her. Nick was increasingly intrigued with what he described as a warm glow that he saw around me. He said, I don't understand. You are exuding a light and strength from within you. I looked him in the eyes and I smiled. I said, Nick, that's Jesus and you can have him too. Friends, we are in the center of the great controversy battle with little time left on this earth. Even devil worshipers know time is short. Satan's fallen angels appear as messengers from the spirit world. In other words, evil angels impersonate dead friends and relatives in order to commune with those that are willing and open to such things. While professing to connect the living into communication with the dead, the prince of evil exercises his enchanting influence over their minds. Satan has the power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. The counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone even, are all rep reproduced with exact distinctness. And there is a perfect example of an evil spirit impersonating the exact likeness of a prophet in scripture. 1 Samuel 28 tells the story of the witch of Endor. She was a woman that King Saul consulted to summon the spirit of the prophet, Dan, uh, prophet Samuel in order to receive advice against the Philistines in battle the next day. Even though Saul knew that witchcraft was considered a sin, shown in 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Earlier in his reign, Saul decreed that all mediums should be put to death. So there were very few magicians and wizards left in his kingdom at this point in time. So in the middle of the night, he disguised himself and sought out a witch hiding in a cave. She summoned supposed prophet Samuel, but this was a demon impersonating the prophet. Saul received terrible news and died the following day in battle. We can see that Satan uses any method to deceive and witchcraft has been prominent since Bible times. Many are, are, many are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven and without suspicion of danger, they give ear to evil spirits and devils. Let me show you this exact warning for our day because we are living in the latter days. 1 Timothy 4, 1-2 now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Evil angels or pretended visitors from the spirit world sometimes utter warnings and foretell future events, giving the appearance of reliability, and their false teachings are readily accepted. They claim to be happy in heaven and occupy an exalted positions there. Then, as the confidence is gained, they present doctrines that undermine the scriptures. If there is any spirit coming to you, you need to compare it to scripture. What are they saying? Does it match with scripture? This is how you will know. This is why we need to know the Bible for ourselves, friends. The very foundation of spiritualism is at war with scripture. Ecclesiastes 9.5 alerts us. 
The dead know nothing. God has forbidden pretended communication with departed spirits. 1 Corinthians 10.20 says, Rather that the things which a Gentile sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. That's clear. Revelation 16, 14, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Interacting with demons from the spirit world was forbidden under penalty of death. Leviticus 19, 31, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them. To be, defiled, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 27. A man or woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. But today, spiritualism has its foothold in scientific circles, it's invaded churches, and has found favor in legislative bodies. This mammoth deception is a revival in a new disguise of the witchcraft condemned of old. Matthew 24, 24 says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Fallen Christendom is referred to as Babylon in Revelation. What does God say is largely responsible for its fall? Revelation 18.2 Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. In other words, Babylon is a state of confusion, Due to devils and spirits penetrating the Christian churches, Christendom is falling because Satan has gained access to the churches through his falsehood that the dead are alive. In too many cases, messages from Satan's ambassadors who pose as spirits of the dead are welcomed as marvelous counsel to the churches from the redeemed in glory. As we just saw in the Bible, the dead are sleeping in their graves. They are not talking ghosts. This lie gives Satan full power to deceive and makes every, he makes every contact count. No wonder the Apostle Paul so solemnly warned us against such deception from seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. According to Revelation, these same evil angels posing as spirits of the dead approach the kings and leaders of the earth. Why do they do that? Revelation 18, 23. By your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. These angels claiming to be, let me just say, these evil angels claiming to be the spirits of the dead will be the powers which will influence the rulers of the nations of the world and lead them into the final battle of Armageddon, which will end in their total destruction. Revelation 16, 14 says, gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Tragically, leaders of many nations today consult with those who claim to receive messages from the dead before deciding on an important issue. No wonder this planet is in such turmoil. The world's decision makers are giving Satan access to rule through them. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20, and when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter. Should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Scripture plainly states that we must refuse to listen to those who claim to speak for the dead and instead obtain our information from God's word only. Messages which supposedly come from dead loved ones are never from your dead loved ones, but rather from Satan. What a sobering thought. Revelation says, those who obey God will enter his kingdom. Who will be among us? 
that are shut out? Revelation 22, 15 says, and this is a strong text, but we need, to, we need to see what it says. God's giving us a warning, a guidance here. Outside the holy gates. So these are the people on the outside of the new Jerusalem, the new holy city uh, of, in the new earth, okay? Outside the holy city gates are dogs and sorcerers, which are mediums, witches, wizards, and whoremongers, sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loves to tell a lie. Those who consult the dead will be shut out of heaven, friends. In Moses' day, God commanded that such be stoned to death. Leviticus 20:27. 20, a man or woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. Witchcraft which claims to contact the dead is called in the Bible one of the works of the flesh for which people will be shut out of God's kingdom. Jesus warns us in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Friends, I'm sharing this with you because we want to know, we want to know how we can be in heaven. And we don't want to practice things when God makes it so plain that we will be shut out of heaven if we practice them. That's why we need to know these lists. And so I, I say this to you with, with, with my heart, with a heart of love. I want to share this with you so that you see God is a God that has standards and we don't want to be in heaven with those that are lying, etc., murdering and all this. So that's why we have these lists. From all these verses we've studied tonight, it is undeniable that we need to stay as far away as possible from anything that in any way resembles witchcraft, no matter how innocently it is packaged. There are not many movies or TV shows or books anymore that don't slip in nuances of life after death, depicting ghosts, witches, idol saint worship. Any presumed contact with the dead is always contact with satanic forces. Beware, friends. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. When Ranja was 10 years old, she became possessed by evil spirits. Her parents took her to a witch doctor and sold 10 cows for her healing, but nothing worked. At 16, she realized new spirits were entering her and they were worse than the first. She would both see and hear them, but others could only hear them. When her first child was born, the spirits asked her to become a witch, but when she refused, they caused her baby to become sick and die. Distraught, she finally consented to do what the spirits wanted if they would give her another child. So nine months later, a daughter was born. Over the next years, she became a very powerful witch. She had no control over her own life, only doing what the spirits told her to do. Through the powerful medicine she concocted, many people were healed and miracles were performed. She had the power to make guns and bullets useless. She became a valuable member of her community and very wealthy because of it. One time, 27 armed men came to her house and even though they tried to harm her with their weapons, they became powerless before her. She even had the power to shut the mouths of crocodiles. When another set of spirits came into her, they would take her to the bottom of a river where she would communicate with them for days at a time, not even coming up to the surface to breathe. Although she was so powerful and could heal people, stop bullets with her hands, she was miserable. One day, Ranja met two young people who told her that they worshiped the one almighty God. Intrigued by this, Ranja went to church with them the following week. She continued to be miserable and was often sick from the punishment of the spirits. 
Just when she was about to give up, she met a Seventh-day Adventist man who told her about Jesus and gave her a Bible. Listening to this man immediately brought peace to her house and she began feeling better. The spirits were not happy and warned her that bad things would happen if she left them. Ranja decided to choose Jesus anyway, and the spirits kept their promise. Her house burned down and she lost everything to the flames. The spirits tormented her day and night with such power that she considered giving in and remaining a witch. But during this time, something happened that would change her life forever. Ranja discovered an Avenus World Radio broadcast. And as she listened daily, her decision was made. Her resolve was strengthened. She would follow Jesus no matter what. The spirits continued to fight against her, but she found out that when she played the AWR radio station, the spirits would leave her alone. Through much prayer, the reading of scripture, and the radio, the spirits are now gone, and today she is a free daughter of God. Ranja tells everyone that true freedom comes only through Jesus. I remember looking into her eyes when we embraced in a hug and I saw Jesus there. Now she is spreading the word of God's truth throughout all the villages that once knew her as a witch, but now know her as a follower in Jesus. All whose faith is not firmly established upon the word of God will be deceived and overcome by Satan and his seducing spirits. Revelation 3.10 warns, Just before us is the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. But Satan, really listen to this, friends, Satan can only win over those that voluntarily yield to his temptations. Those who are earnestly seeking a knowledge of Bible truth like you are tonight, striving to purify your soul through obedience, you will find a sure defense in God's word. From Genesis to Revelation, angels are sent on a mission of mercy to the children of God, just like they are today. God sent angels to Abraham with promises of blessing, to the gates of Sodom to rescue righteous Lot from its fiery doom. Angels were sent to Elijah as, was, as he was about to perish from weariness and hunger in the desert, to Elisha with chariots and horses of fire surrounding the little town where he was shut in by his foes. Angels were sent to Daniel while seeking divine wisdom in the court of a heathen king or abandoned to become the lion's prey to Peter, who was doomed to death in Herod's dungeon, to the prisoners at Philippi, to Paul and his companions in the night of tempest on the sea, to open the mind of Cornelius to receive the gospel, to dispatch Peter with the message of salvation to the Gentile stranger. Thus, holy angels have in all ages ministered to God's people. Jesus would sooner send every angel out of heaven to protect his people than leave one soul that trusts in him to be overcome by Satan. Have you made a decision to follow Jesus tonight? There's never been a moment that you were forgotten. Jesus will send out an army to fight for you. No matter where you are or what you have done, he will rescue you. He delivers the captive, he overcomes evil, he defends the weak, and he protects the feeble. He strengthens and he sustains, he guards and he guides. You're not defenseless, he's available to you always. Just ask him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are the light and our salvation. Your ways are always the best. Thank you for making it so plain in scripture that when we die, we simply sleep. Lord, protect each one of us from all danger, especially counterfeit teachings. Because of you, we never need to be afraid. May each one of us completely put our trust in you in Jesus' precious, powerful name, amen. 
friend, we'd like to know if this message was clear to you tonight. Will you take a moment to click below and let us know? This Bible truth may be different than what you've always believed or what your church teaches. So if you have unanswered questions and would like further Bible study, we have Bible instructors standing by right now to help you. Just click the link below. Maybe you are dealing with spiritualism like Nick or Ranja and would like us to pray for you. Please click the link to share your prayer request. God bless you. Thank you for watching Unlocking Bible Prophecies. Meet me back here for tomorrow night's topic, The Rescue. There's no secret as to how Jesus plans to save you. Choose God's way. Good night, friends. Thank you.